We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. We have swept the tough parts of motherhood under the rug in the hope that no one notices the difficult truth that motherhood is not perfect. These are the wise words from my witness today. Geraldine Walsh is a freelance journalist and author of the book Unraveling Motherhood, Understanding Your Experience Through Self-Reflection, Self-Care and Authenticity. She's the mother of two daughters, which are nine and five, and lives with her husband in Dublin. So, Geraldine, what is the problem with hiding the tough parts of motherhood? I think if we allow ourselves to experience our lives in a vacuum, that we're not necessarily giving ourselves the opportunity to grow. And I know that for myself, my own experience of motherhood has been quite complicated. And I certainly swept a a huge amount under the rug and didn't allow others to see me for who I was and what I was experiencing. And essentially, I more or less hid the difficulties that I was experiencing, which just doesn't help to actually overcome any difficulties. It doesn't help to overcome the belief that motherhood is wonderful and perfect and and you're just, you fall in love with your children and, and everything's happy um, and that you're eternally grateful. And, and you know, we, we live in this balance of a tug and pull within motherhood that we're loving our children so much and yet hating the experience. That's a really weird mixture, isn't it? We love our children, but we're not so keen on being a mother. I mean, how on earth did we get to this point? But I think that we, we, go, we go into motherhood with the expectations massive expectations about what it's going to be like. There's that kind of understanding that motherhood comes easy, that breastfeeding is is, is straightforward, that we have this idea that we can carry on and and manage the entire mental overload that that comes with motherhood, but it doesn't necessarily work out like that. So what were your expectations? If I had been interviewing you nine years ago, or probably 10 years ago, what would you have said to you? How how were you expecting motherhood to be? I kind of, you know, the the word easy is is always in my head, right? Not necessarily easy, but that it sort of came naturally. I think that's the word, isn't it? Naturally. Naturally. Yeah. I didn't have any real understanding of what motherhood was essentially as this huge, big, all-encompassing experience. And you you can't go into parenthood in general and think that life's not going to change. And, you know, you hear all those stories of people saying, and I said it myself, oh no, nothing's going to change. She'll slot right into our lives. <laughs> uh, like that just doesn't happen. It, and, and it shouldn't happen either because, you know, raising another human being is an incredible experience, but it's overwhelming and exhausting. And we don't recognize that our entire lives are going to shift and not necessarily in a way we expected. So I know that when I was becoming a mother, I, I I pretty much didn't think past pregnancy. So I didn't even think about birth. I didn't think about how her birth was going to occur. I just imagined it was going to happen. It's going to be natural. Yeah, well, yeah. And, And I certainly went into this whole experience. I was very much, I loved being pregnant, but at the same time, I had very strong, difficult pregnancies. I had hyperemesis on my first daughter, so I was sick the entire time. And yet I I loved the idea that I was growing her and that she was becoming a part of me and that even that her DNA will always be a part of me. And I think that's that's a wonderful concept to kind of consider that when we, we are pregnant with our children, that a part of them stays with us. But I think it's that understanding that they will always be a part of us that we don't necessarily take on board fully when we do become parents. So when we do move into that stage of of actively caring for our our newborns and our children, we have to realise that we change. We change not only with the the day-to-day 
life, everything that we have to do with our children, but we, we change with our identity and our experiences and we fundamentally, fundamentally become different people. So when was the moment when you suddenly realised, oops, it's not what I expected? Was there a particular moment? I think this is the, the really interesting thing about, about motherhood is that you don't have a, a pin drop. You become consumed. We don't have the opportunity or the chance to sit back and actually think, whoa, hold on a second. This actually is a bit different to what I expected. This is not aligning with my understanding of life. This is not what I wanted out of motherhood. I am feeling so incredibly lost and a shell of myself and I have lost so much of my identity and my purpose and who I want to be. So we don't have that moment. It is a gradual kind of, I call it a kind of picking up the spots of motherhood. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's this, you know, I very much felt like there was two, two people there. There was me mm-hmm. and there was the mother me. So it was this challenge between mother me and me, me. So what, <laughs> what was the difference between mother Geraldine and me Geraldine? I always consider Mother Me being a very strong, creative, forthright person who seems to just know more than I do. But I balance that against wanting desperately to still be me. So tell me about the me, me then. Mm. So I understand, because I'm not quite certain at the moment who I'm meeting. Am I meeting (laughs) me, me or, or Mother Me? Well, this is the thing. So we, we have to try and figure out who we are within this whole bedlam of motherhood. So we do have the opportunity. I feel like we have the opportunity to pause, but it's finding that pause that is the most difficult part of of motherhood, finding the, the space and the time to actually be articulate with ourselves as to how we want to experience motherhood and life. So I know for myself that it wasn't until I experienced quite severe postnatal depression and anxiety that I was given that opportunity. Well, I don't suppose I was given the opportunity, but I was, I forced myself into taking that opportunity because the the experience was so intense that I had to unravel myself. And was this with your first daughter or your second daughter? This is with my second daughter. So on my first daughter, I had mild postnatal depression, but I didn't recognize it as such. I didn't know what I was experiencing. I didn't, on my first daughter, I felt as though all of the experiences that I was having, that I, I literally took about a year to bond with her. I didn't feel like I was her mother. I didn't feel close to her. I didn't feel like I had that motherly instinct. And yet I was caring for her. I was doing, I was doing the job. I didn't feel connected with her. So I did not recognize the experience that I was having on my first daughter until I managed to unravel my thoughts around motherhood on my second. So there was a space of five years there where I was in motherhood, but not aligning with, not having the potential to feel as though I could align with my own identity and experiences and and feel empowered by motherhood because I truly believe that we can be empowered by motherhood and that we can feel very much connected to our our mother me. (laughs) So I'm hearing you saying, and you'd have to correct me if I'm wrong, that you were performing motherhood rather than being. Is, Is that what I'm hearing? I think that's a good way to put it because we definitely do the job. There's no doubt about it that we, we, we have the sleepless nights. We have the countless baby grows on, on the radiator. We're, we're constantly caring and loving and supporting and nurturing our children. But what gets left behind is ourselves. So you said that you actually were sort of had the pause pushed on you by actually having postnatal depression after your second daughter was born and actually really recognising it this time. So tell us about that forced pause and what you discovered. It was definitely a different experience the second time round. I had, again, a difficult pregnancy and my daughter, I was 10 weeks pregnant when I suffered a subchorionic hematoma, which is a a very heavy bleed. And I, I obviously thought I was losing her. And I spent, I spent my entire pregnancy with this belief that I had to hold her in to protect her and nurture her and, and make sure she was delivered. And thankfully, she's here with us and she's perfect. But that experience was so intense that, I mean, I suppose I didn't recognize how intense it was, but it developed within me 
prenatal depression and anxiety. And the anxiety certainly crept up by eight months. I was, I knew I was anxious. Obviously, you put that onto the, the understanding that you're about to give birth and you're worried about that. So that anxiousness was, I just felt like it was a norm with the situation that I was experiencing. Of course, I'm going to be anxious. I'm about to give birth. But two weeks after she was born, I was out with my sister and her children. And my husband had gone back to work and there was definite shift when he went back to work that, you know, he was my safe space. He was my my care. So he was always there for me. And when he went back to work, I was certainly knocked in a way that brought on or showcased the anxiety a lot more. And my sister recognised that my anxiousness was not normal. And then I discussed it with my mother and she was the same. She was saying there was a lot of my behaviours for the last while had not been, they just weren't me. And certainly they encouraged me to get support and help. Now, that support and help was not forthcoming. I went to my GP for the checkup with my daughter and essentially I was fobbed off. I didn't get the support from my GP that I needed. And it wasn't until I think it was the six week checkup with my daughter that the public health nurse, she came out to do her normal checks and to see if the baby was developing right and everything was going okay. And at that time, I mean, I should have known, but at, I, I, I kind of always assumed that those public health checks were only for the baby. And <laughs> genuinely, I just thought well, she's only coming here to check out, make sure I'm not doing anything wrong with the baby and she's doing okay. And she, she was packing up all of her things and she said to me, so mum, how are you? And I was shook. I was just like, oh my God, she's actually asking me how I am. Why? Why would she ask me that? And I broke down. I completely broke down and, and I wasn't coping. I wasn't managing very well. And it was I talked to her about what I was experiencing and, and all of the, the anxiousness, the anxiety, the, the, the rage that I was experiencing, which is something that we don't talk about, which it falls under the umbrella of postnatal depression. But after that, I got, she gave me a number of, of a therapist to chat to. And I was very lucky that I got an appointment. Well, I think it was actually three months after she was born that I got my first appointment to see a therapist and, and I'm indebted to her because she set me off on a path of recovery. So those therapy sessions were definitely the starting point for my understanding of myself and what I was experiencing and that, and that I was okay, that there, there wasn't essentially anything wrong with me, that I was going through an intense shift and transformation within motherhood and that I could align myself again. So it was my choice at that stage not to take medication and to go through a therapy route and see if that worked for me. Now, it took me three years to find myself again. What I definitely feel is though the intense anxiety that I had, I was, I was experiencing 30 plus anxiety attacks a day. I couldn't go outside my front door. I couldn't even organize for a tradesman to come and fix something in the house. I, I couldn't make a phone call. I couldn't cook dinners. I remember putting up on Instagram one day where I was cooking a, a curry from scratch and I was saying, this is an achievement for me. <laughs> cooking a full curry from absolute scratch with my own spices and everything because it felt like a turning point for me. But it wasn't until I kind of allowed myself to accept that I was going through a huge upheaval that I managed to reassess everything about my life, reassess who I was, what I was going through, that the feelings that I was experiencing were okay to experience. So what was it that you needed to learn in this period? Uh, I definitely needed to learn to put myself first or to even acknowledge that I was there because a lot of a lot of the time you're 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 carrying on with looking after the family and the house and and working on your job and there's no space left for you and you know that phrase where you can't fill from an empty cup was something that definitely kind of struck a chord with me because I was so very empty in everything that there was nothing really left for me to give to my children, to my family, to my husband. And I, I was very much that shell of myself. And if I wanted to feel complete, I had to allow myself to see what I do. And one of the things that my counsellor had said to me in one of our first sessions, and, and it's, a, it's an exercise that I have included in the book because I found it so powerful, is that if you wake up in the morning and make a list of the things that you want to do in that day, maybe it could be five things that you definitely want to do in that day. And if by the end of the day, if you go back and look at that list and you have not done any of it, 
we're going to feel like, oh shit, I've done it again. I've done absolutely nothing and berate ourselves for, for it all. But if we then make another list of all of the things that we did do, that list is going to be a hell of a lot longer than that first original list that we wanted to do because we don't see everything that we actually do do. We kind of think we're supposed to do this, that and the other, but I only have time to do all of this other stuff. And it was quite an eye opener for me to see that, well, actually I am kind of achieving and moving forward and, and giving so much of myself to everybody else in my family. Where is it in that list that I've given anything to myself? And usually it's, you know, nothing or very minimal. So how would looking after yourself be on the ground? You know, give us some practical things that you were doing that made you feel as if you were looking after yourself. The idea of self-care is is everywhere these days. And I think um, I've got a a bit of a love-hate relationship with this idea of self-care because it's confused in what it is. It's a massage in a bath. Exactly. Yeah. And a nice coffee and, and that kind of thing. For me, it was allowing myself to, one, see myself, to give myself space to nurture all of the elements of my life that I need. So my emotional needs, my, my physical needs, my... And, and I'm understanding that, but if you could give me some practical examples, then I can really understand what you mean. Practical. Let me think about that. (laughs) It's been a while. (laughs) So essentially, I, I definitely managed to find boundaries. Ah. But with finding my boundaries within my life, I had to also release a huge amount of guilt. So I built boundaries around my kids because I needed to have space for myself. So, you know, this idea of kids being so very much on top of you, like you, (laughs) I have lived for entire days with my children literally clinging off of me. And that's quite an overwhelming sensory experience, which definitely doesn't help me manage anxiety. I would build up boundaries with my children and say, if I have a cup of coffee in my hand, you are not to be on top of me. You are to give me my space. And, you know, that took a long time for them to learn their kids. <laughs> but if they did learn it and they do now understand that if, you know, I, I, I now have a, a remit to give myself this space to have a coffee and have my book. And so I'm sitting there and I'm reading and I have my drink and my children know that mom's taking like 10, 15 minutes to rest because my kids would never have seen me rest before. Whereas now they know they have this idea that mom needs rest, that mom needs to do this, mom needs to do that. And there's a huge amount of guilt involved with allowing yourself to take space from your children. I want to say how wonderful, because when they have children, you'll be teaching them that they're allowed to have space because I'm prepared to put a very large sum of money on the fact that your mother never sat down when you were a child. But this is the funny thing. I, I remember a, a lot about my mom. A lot of my expectations about motherhood definitely came from how I saw my mother. And I, she was incredible. Like she's, she was the type of 1980s mother who had buns baking when we come home from school. And so from what I would have seen from her, I definitely kind of I thought that she was the perfect mother raising us. And she tells me now, you know, no, I took my space from you. She's, she tells me that she used to hide from us. She used to run up the stairs and hide at the side of her bed because we'd be constantly coming, running after her, looking for her. <laughs> yeah, but if she hadn't have done that, I and wouldn't she'd have done, done it, what, yeah. If she had actually said, right, these are magic things. I've got a magic cup and I've got a magic book. <laughs> and when I'm holding the magic cup and the magic book, there's a force field around me and you can't Absolutely. get there. You know, <laughs> if she'd done that, then you would have had permission to do that. And yes, what is yeah. wonderful is you're giving permission for your children to also have downtime when they become mothers too. Yeah. And I think that's part of the reason why I don't feel so guilty about it, because I know I'm allowing them, I'm giving them the opportunity to build their own boundaries. So I know Mm. my nine-year-old now is, she's at that stage where she's looking for her own space and essentially her own space from her little sister. So she, we did her bedroom up a, a short while ago where she has this nice relaxed space with a sofa in her bedroom so she can go in and take that space for herself and not feel like she has to be playing with her sister all the time. So I'm, I, I feel like I'm releasing that guilt for myself because I think we, we do have that guilt as mothers that we should be giving all of our time and all of our, our energy to our children. But 
by taking back some of that time, we're giving them the opportunity to see that they need the same nurturing as well. And if you're entertaining them all the time and supervising their play all the time, mm-hmm. how are they going to learn to play themselves? Exactly. Yeah, how are exactly. they going to create their own imaginations? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we're on the Easter holidays at the moment and the idea that the kids are allowed to be bored is a huge thing for me, that it's okay for them to be bored and I don't have to fill in all of those spaces for them. They will, they will find something to do. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I was a child and being bored, my mother would come up with the most ghastly suggestions, like clean, <laughs> cleaning out the garage. Which Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if that was deliberate, because actually, sometimes when I was bored was when the most creative things came out. You know, one bored afternoon, a friend and I started playing radio stations. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and we not only had the most wonderful time, but from then onwards, we never played anything but radio stations. Mm. And, you know, I worked in radio and here I am over 55 years later talking to you. I'm still doing the same (laughs) stuff. And that was all because I was bored. And if my mother had been the entertainment committee all the time, I probably would not be sitting here with you today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I very much believe that, yeah. And how do you deal with self-criticism? Because it seems to me that self-criticism is the biggest enemy of most mothers. Mm, And I think that's a huge knot that we have to unravel. And, you know, I'm definitely not perfect at it. I definitely have still criticised myself. But we do have this ability to have flexible thinking. So we can get very rigid in our thinking as to how we see ourselves and judge ourselves. So there are ways to kind of unknot that belief that we we are not good enough or we're not doing the best by our children. Let's just bring in somebody who's incredibly important at this point, Winnicott. Mm. And it's like the very first thing as a therapist you're taught, the whole idea of being good enough. Because actually therapists and mothers have quite a bit in common because actually if we were perfect therapists and we actually were able to sort of basically solve all of our clients' problems, they wouldn't actually learn anything themselves. Mm. Why is being a good enough mother important rather than being a perfect mother? Well, firstly, there's no such thing as perfect. We will always be chasing a perfect idea and that's never going to suffice. The good enough mother is definitely something that we should align with, but it's it's hard to get there. I know that from myself and my own experience. I, I felt I very much judged myself and didn't meet the expectations that I had surrounding motherhood. And I felt very, I suppose, flawed in how I was approaching motherhood, you know, and, and they're looking at the social media feeds that I have on Instagram and, and Twitter and everything else. And, and people are... People just seem to be managing motherhood better than I do. <laughs> they seem to be just getting on with it or are having great holidays and, and you know, their kids are well dressed and, <laughs> and, and everything just seems perfect on, on the online world. But that's just a snippet of someone's life and, and not necessarily the reality of what someone's actually experiencing or going through. So one of the great problems you seem to be telling me of of motherhood is you can get overwhelmed very easily. Things that actually on one level don't actually seem very big can become triggers of getting angry, frustrated, hot and upset and all those other things. And so you have this idea of the parental pause. So tell me first of all where it comes from and then let's walk through the steps of it. I generally feel we can be certainly triggered quite a lot within motherhood within momentary instances that happen with our children. And we can become overwhelmed, we can become anxious, we can become fearful and we may not be able to step outside of those feelings that we're experiencing at that time and we can run with them. And Alison Keating is a psychologist in Ireland and she's incredible. And there's days when I feel like I need to just dip into her stories and just see what she's talking about because she has a wonderful way of kind of balancing and centering us. She talks through this idea of the parental pause and what we can do to manage those overstimulated moments that we have with the motherhood. And it's definitely a, a practical exercise that we can do, but it's, there's a thought pattern within it that we need to actually take the opportunity to do it. And that takes practice, but it's, it's definitely something I would recommend for people to consider. And she talks through these steps of 
obviously at the beginning with your children are safe um, and if it is safe for you to do so, to go somewhere so that you can self-soothe, so that you can give yourself the space to connect with yourself, which is certainly something that we don't always have the moments to do within parenthood. So if we have that opportunity to take that step back, take a deep breath and allow ourselves to to calm the amygdala down, to calm our brains down so that we can actually focus on what we are going through and what we need. So she says to to tune into our bodies and to experience what physically is happening within us. Is our heart rate racing faster? Are we, is our, our shoulders shaking? What we are physically experiencing within our body and what thoughts are running through our head because we can go very much on overdrive. And so many different thoughts are running through our head and, and whether those thoughts are real or not is something that we need to break through so that we can calm ourselves down and, and to reassess our situation. And then she allows herself, she tells us to allow ourselves to feel, to allow those feelings to, to sit with us and, and to accept those feelings because some of those feelings can be quite intense and quite raw that we push away from them and we don't allow ourselves to process them. I know for myself, when I'm experiencing this, I generally have a huge amount of fear and self-hate and judgment about myself, about what I'm actually doing and why I'm so wrong. Those sort of feelings that come up for me, while they can be so intensely raw, the idea that every feeling is valid is hugely important because we can't just dismiss what we're experiencing or what we're feeling. That does not benefit (laughs) us in any way. Yeah. And then she, she advises us to, to think about what is actually upsetting us within that moment. So it, you know, it could be an instance that our child is having a tantrum, but whatever the child is having a tantrum about is valid for them. But why we're experiencing such an intense reaction to their experience, why are we experiencing that? And what is it that's upsetting us? And then it's, you know, we, we work through those feelings that we, that have all come up for us and, and to see, well, where are they actually stuck within us? Where, where are we actually experiencing them? For me, it was always very heavily within my chest and my shoulders. Everything, all of my emotions seemed to just sit very heavily within all of those muscles around my shoulders. And what we have to do at that stage is to allow those emotions to, to be released and um, through whatever manner we kind of need them to be. And I think with my own anxiety that I was experiencing, those emotions certainly came out quite heavy and, and quite raw and quite strong that releasing them was this quite powerful ejection of the intensity of, of what I was experiencing. And the point is, is to allow yourself to accept what you're going through and what you're experiencing and not to fob it off, not to say, well, that doesn't matter or to, 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 to forget about it. Because the more we forget about these intense reactions that we're having, the more we're incapable of soothing ourselves when they do occur again and again and again. And the problem with motherhood is that there's quite a lot of triggers within our experiences of being a parent. This is like a, a muscle kind of reflex. We have to build on those muscles in, in self-soothing ourselves. So when we manage to get to a stage where we feel that this process of going through experiencing the emotions that we're feeling, where they're getting caught up physically within our body, we're able to release them a lot easier and feel better for ourselves for doing that. And it really helps if you place your hand gently on wherever you're actually feeling it. Mm. So if it's the throat, put your hand there on your throat. If it's the chest and you feel it there, put your hand there. So you're sort of actually highlighting that part of your body. Close your eyes and allow the emotions to move, to release. If there's tears, let's have the tears, let's have a big sigh or whatever. And then she's suggesting if you have time to revisit it 20 minutes later to give your nervous system a chance to regulate. Absolutely. How do you deal with this sixth step yourself? Yeah, I think this is probably the hardest step because you're still very much judging yourself for for the reactions that you may have had. And I know for myself, when I'm going through this, there's a, a huge amount of acceptance that's needed to allow ourselves to feel these feelings and to have these reactions. You know, it's not all going to be plain sailing. So by accepting the fact that we are going to experience these moments, we're able to process them a lot easier. 
And I think that normally there's a sort of an old wound that's here. So maybe a little bit of journaling would be a good idea to sort of see, you know, what is this bringing up? What is this connecting with? Why is this so difficult for me? Did you manage to make any any deeper connections that you can share with us that might help us, Geraldine? Yeah, listening to that kind of inner voice that we have and not judging her for the things that she's saying. It's that, that idea that this inner voice that we have is that kind of, that mother me, I suppose, who's nurturing ourselves. If we can unknot ourselves so much that we're able to listen to her and, and hear what she's trying to say to us and, and what we're experiencing and allowing ourselves to heal is quite an empowering moment for us when we can, in some ways, rationalize what we're experiencing, but also allowing ourselves to, to feel. And what I always say, if it's good enough for your children, it's good enough for you. So if you're doing this for your children, you need to do this for your inner child as well. A bit of, you know, you're kind to your children. You can be kind to yourself too. Okay, we're going to take a pause and then we're going to be looking at a letter about the long-term impact of being a mother. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. If you'd like to participate in The Meaningful Life, you can become a supporter, which would be really brilliant because you can help fund this podcast. We'll give details of that at the end and all the bonus material you get if you become a supporter. You can join our Substack newsletter where you get details about what's happening in The Meaningful Life and one of my thought-provoking articles. That comes out every two weeks. You'll find details of that and how to send a letter in to us at www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. And so let's look at a letter that somebody has sent in to us using that particular space. My mother is in therapy. I never thought I would write those words. Like many women of her generations, she struggled on until she could manage no longer. I wrote to her therapist to say if he would facilitate a session where I could say what I needed to say to her. My mother has agreed for me to attend one of these sessions with her, but she sees it as an opportunity to say what she needs from me, so I am worried. Will I finally get the opportunity to share what I need to say? Can the therapist stop it turning into a blame fest? How can I finally be heard? What can I ask the therapist for? So, Geraldine, what did you think of this? From the conversations that I've had with my own mother, since my diagnosis of postnatal depression and and anxiety, we've definitely become a lot closer because she seems to understand me a lot more than I ever thought she could have. And then, of course, with writing this book, and she read the book and she would come back to me after every chapter that she would read and she would say, oh my God, I relate so much to what you say. The fundamental experience of motherhood, I don't think has necessarily changed over the generations, except for the fact that my generation have the space to discuss what we're experiencing. Whereas my mother in the 80s raising us, she didn't have that opportunity. She didn't have the space to unravel herself, to unknot herself, and to allow herself to balance her understanding of who she wanted to be alongside being a mother. And I think that generationally, there is a difficulty with speaking to a mother about her experiences when she has adult children. So I think that my worry would be for this person would be understanding her experience because this may be her first opportunity to share what she actually went through as a mother for her generation. You know, I I definitely feel like we're now getting to a stage where we're giving ourselves the space to discuss motherhood in all of its raw and vulnerable forms. And it's a great idea to talk to parents about how how we were raised and, and the differences between parenting between now and then. But I feel like, I feel sad for the mother in a lot of ways, because now with adult children, she's now getting the opportunity 
to talk about her experience. And it may not be the way this person expects it to have been. The hardships that she probably experienced back then, she, you know, it, it's not like she's an open book. It's now she's kind of feeling like she's managing to work through certain issues that may very much have been difficult for her. I think it's a tricky one. So did your mother feel very defensive as she read your book? Because every time my mother used to read any of my books, well, actually she never did, her concern was always that's going to be full of criticism of her, even if the book was, you know, I never in, while she was alive, wrote a book about parenting or what it was like to be a child or anything else like that. It was all adult relationships, but her concern was that it was all about her and it would be full of criticism of her. Did your mother think that your book was going to be full of criticism of her? I remember when I was writing the book and I had mentioned to both my parents, my mum and my dad, that I had mentioned them in the book. And there was a reaction to that. And I understand that reaction now quite explicitly after unraveling a huge amount of my own experience in motherhood and parenthood. And while there are kind of analogies of certain aspects of my mother within the book, she, I remember there was, there's one massive analogy I have of the open door and it's about building boundaries. And it's very much about my mother in the 1980s and us as kids running in and out of our house, leaving that front door open. And she loved that analogy. She loved that she was brought into it in that instance because she remembers those days. She remembers how hard they were. She remembers how, how crap they were. <laughs> you know, she, we definitely spoke about her difficulties within motherhood after she read the book. So she wasn't defensive in that sense, but she, she would have been, before she read it, she would have been nervous as to how much I would have included about her as a mother. But I think from, from my experience of writing the book, I'm very much inclusive of the idea that mothers are very raw and very vulnerable and, and we are all flawed. We are all human beings. So my understanding of my mother, while she's in this sort of beautiful space of being, for me, a, a gorgeous mother, I know the hardships that she experienced. So I was able to manage that and balance it a bit. So I think rawness is a really useful word when you're approaching this, because you're going to be raw and she's going to be raw. And so what can you ask the therapist for? So I think you can ask the therapist for tenderness. Your mother is going to feel criticised that generally mothers expect their children to criticise them. They expect to be criticised by society in general. So they're going to be on the defensive. So I think that to start off with, you really want to be trying to get a bond going. And I think actually what she wants to tell you might be a very good place to start. So I think what you want is from the therapist is a bit of support to be able to hear what she's got to say. Because generally, in my experience, once people have been heard, they're much more willing to actually hear you. What I would also do is, from one of the things you've got to say, start off with all the positives. So start off with the stuff like, thank you very much, mum, for all the stuff that you did for us. You know, I really appreciate A, B and C. And, you know, that she's going to actually, at this point, her defences are going to go down a bit. And then you can say, but there's actually something I in particular need to talk about. And I think you really want to keep these down to one or two things and tell her, this is how it came across to me. So, you know, can you tell me how it came across for you? And I think that way, if you're forever building bridges, she'll be able to hear this stuff. Because what we have to remember is that we come from an entirely different generation. We come from the generation where, you know, these days, if I say to clients, oh, and what's your experience with therapy beforehand? I mean, most people today who come and see me have had sort of five kinds of therapy before. Most people of your mother's generation have had nothing. So this is all very new for her. So she's going to be very defensive. I think that you can 
ask for more than one session, I don't think you're going to be able to hear her and she's going to be here, able to hear you in just one session. I think you're going to need two or three sessions. That will reduce the tension as well and maybe get some support as well. So you've had a chance to think about what I really want to say and what I will say. It's an exercise I sometimes do with my clients so that we give space for the stuff you want to say, but is possibly too cruel or is coming from an angry place and the things that you feel can be heard because there's no point saying something that can't be heard. So a bit of preparation beforehand, maybe even with your own therapist or with a friend and somebody to support you afterwards. So you can go and say, oh gosh, it was terrible or it was wonderful. And you sort of don't know which it's going to be but it is a really brave and wonderful thing to do to ask to have this conversation because I think the biggest problem of all is silence. I think you'll agree with me about this, Geraldine. Silence is the enemy. Absolutely. If we don't uh, highlight what we're experiencing or what we're feeling, no one can read our minds. So we have to speak out, we have to speak up and we have to share. So what's the most important lesson you've learned from being a mother, Geraldine? I think communication is intensely valid, not only as a mother, but as a partner. I've always come with myself and my husband, we've kind of always had this understanding that if we don't communicate with each other, we're not going to move forward. We're not going to get past any blocks that we have in life. And we're in this together. We're in this as a partnership. So we need to continually communicate how we're experiencing everything in our lives and, and what we're feeling and, and what we need, because it's the same similar sort of instances that you know, we can't read each other's minds. We don't know what, what each other is thinking and we don't know what each other needs. So communication is, I think, one of the biggest things I've learned in motherhood and as a wife that we we need to keep ourselves, to keep that, those lines of communication open. And what I would say is it's actually really important to communicate with yourself as well, not just Absolutely. with other people, but look inside yourself. Actually, what are you not admitting to yourself? Because, you know, that is really important because if you're not communicating with yourself, it's going to be very difficult to communicate with other people. Absolutely. So we've almost reached the end of the programme. So I have to ask you as a witness on The Meaningful Life, what makes your life meaningful? What makes my life meaningful? Definitely family. Family has been, has always been a number one for me since I was a child. The bond that we have as a unit, as a family, that is extremely important for me. Acceptance is also huge, which, you know, I'm, I'm almost 40 and it's only now that I've allowed myself to accept myself the way I am for who I am. And in that I'm accepting others for who they are. And I find that, that 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 acceptance is quite freeing in allowing myself to live the way I want to live and living with people who the way they want to live. So acceptance is quite huge for me. Now, normally on The Meaningful Life, at the very end, in the bonus material, which you normally don't hear, I ask my guests for three things they know deep down to be true. And when I asked these questions to Geraldine, we really got deep into the topic. So what I've decided this time is to actually include this here in the main program. And the reason I'm doing that is for two points. One, so that you realise just how deep we do go in the bonus material and to encourage you to actually become a supporter of The Meaningful Life. And the other one is because I think this is really necessary to be heard. So let's have the three things that she knows deep down to be true. I very much believe that life is not linear. I would have definitely, you know, 10 years ago, if you had asked me that, I would have sort of thought that life comes in stages and that we take our way through the different stages of life, whether that's, you know, childhood, adolescence, college, marriage, children, and, and the rest of it. It doesn't, life doesn't work like that. So I definitely believe that life is not linear and it's not linear for a reason, that the ebbs and flows of life are the moments that teach us, that guide us, that change us, and that that's okay. That we can be afraid of the the difficulties that happen within our lives, but they are the things that make us who we are. And the second thing? 
every feeling is valid. Oh, I love that. <laughs> every feeling is valid. Why is every feeling valid? Mm. This was something that I definitely fought against for a long time, especially when I was experiencing anger in motherhood. I would chastise myself for feeling in any way angry, mostly because there were underlying feelings within that that I wasn't addressing. And when I learned that every feeling that I have matters, it gave me permission to feel those feelings and not brush them aside and not feel like I was broken for feeling them. And it's something that I teach my children that it is okay to feel, that it's okay to feel bad, that it's okay to feel sad, that it's okay to feel angry. And it's in our understanding of why we're feeling a certain way that helps us. So I, I strongly believe that we need to understand that every feeling we have is important, that's there for a reason. And what a beautiful thing to teach your children. And the third thing you know deep down to be true. That I am enough. Oh, lovely. Tell me more about um, that. Sorry, I'm actually getting a bit emotional. Um, That's okay. <laughs> Tell me why you're getting emotional. I think over the last um, the last while, I've, you know, obviously with the, with the book, um, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of mothers who have related so strongly to what I've written about my own experience of anxiety and where I was within motherhood and where I am now. And that it took so long for me to feel that I was enough, that I was the person that I am is the person that my children need. And I suppose I fought against that belief that I was enough for a long time, that I tried harder than I needed to and gave myself a lot of hardships along the way because I was trying to be someone that I wasn't. So now that I feel that I am enough and that I am attempting to encourage other mothers to recognize that what is there enough and knowing that it's such a huge transformation in who we are and what we, what we can get out of life and knowing that it's quite empowering to feel enough when there was a stage in my life when I really felt so weak in that experience mm. that I couldn't give my children what they needed when all they needed was me. Yeah. Because you are enough. Yeah. Would you like to say that for me one last time, please? <laughs> because I am enough. And yes. I think, I think every mother needs to recognize that she, she is exactly what her children need. We only have one mother. We only have that connection with someone who, who understands us a lot more than we think we do. And when we can give ourselves the space to understand ourselves, that's, that's quite important for us, let alone our kids. Yeah, it's a very special thing to be able to say to yourself because when you say to yourself, I am enough, you don't get defensive. You can hear what other people mm. have got to say. You're not continually fighting that negative voice inside your head. So yeah. Yeah. thank you for giving us that as one of the three things you know deep down to be true. Thank you. So now we move on to the bonus material. We're going to be talking about superhero therapy and accepting your flaws. If you'd like to hear that bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. And we're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, and please do hear are all the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. 
Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Collick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.